Um, it's, it's kind of funny. So John asked me, okay, Jacob, what do you want to preach over uh, this week? And uh, earlier, like a month before, I was taking a walk down at Linear Park um, on the south side, I believe, where it goes down by the river. It's beautiful. And I, I was thinking about Psalm 1, and I was like, if I ever get the chance to teach again, I'm going to teach on Psalm 1. And then he asked me like a month later, and I was like, well, I guess I'll teach on Psalm 1. So, um, but I'll be teaching on Psalm 1 this morning, and specifically, I'll be teaching on the theme of biblical meditation. So, kind of as an introduction, actually, I'm going to pray before I keep on going. So, God, I thank you, I thank you for this morning. I thank you um, that you want us to know you, that you have made yourself known to us in your word and through your Son, Jesus, um, and that you draw our hearts to yourself. I'm really thankful for that this morning, God, and I, I pray this morning uh, that you would show yourself, that you would open our eyes to see you, God. I pray that you'd build uh, even more within myself and within my family a desire to know you and to know your word. Um, you can do these things, Father, in us, so I ask that you do them. For all these things, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So, I'll be talking about biblical meditation this morning. And first I want to say, what is biblical meditation? The short definition that John and I came up with was intentionally dwelling on the Word of God. And if you turn to Deuteronomy 6, 6, 4, you get a little picture of it. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, um, is what some call the greatest command. It's also called the Shema, um, because it starts with the Hebrew word listen, which is Shema. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So this is often considered the greatest command. And if you keep on reading, you see, what, what, what do we do with this command and also the law of God? He says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And I love that, and I think it shows a picture of biblical meditation. The words, the truths that God had given them, they were to, they were to have them everywhere. <laughs> they were to talk about them as they walked. They were to talk about them as, they, as a family when they sat down. God wanted their word to be a part of every part of their lives and touch every part of their lives. That's a picture of biblical meditation. And I want to say really quick um, that this Bible is God's revelation. If you take a moment to think about it, it's pretty mind-blowing that the God of the universe has decided to make himself known to mankind through his word, through, through the Bible. And that's beautiful. Why he decided a book, I don't know, but this is the way he's decided to do it. This is the way that he's decided to make himself known. And across 66 books, it tells, um, as the Bible Project puts it, it tells it's one unified story that leads to Jesus means from beginning to end, all of this book leads to Jesus and his redemptive work. Um, I don't know if you're through a Bible reading plan. Uh, you're probably around Leviticus right now if you're doing a year-long one, and you might be wondering, how does this lead to Jesus? I don't know. I don't see it. Um, you should come to the Old Testament class, because John will tell you how it does. <laughs> um, but it, it does. In fact, there's a scene in the Bible after Jesus' resurrection, where he goes and he teaches his disciples, starting at the beginning, how all of it leads to him. That's awesome. And as you read your Bible, you'll see that it's different than any book that you've come across before. Um, it will not be like, I don't know, Hunger Games or something like that. And this Bible is written um, as, uh, I've heard it called, uh, Jewish meditation literature. But when you read through it, you realize it doesn't have a lot of the details that you get in, in books today. Um, but every detail that God has in his word, I believe, is important, is valuable, and it speaks to who God is. And these are beautiful truths, and I say all these things to say, knowing, knowing the word of God and knowing God will take a lifetime, take 
all of your life, dwelling on, meditating, drawing closer to the person of God. I am young, 26. I grew up in the church, though, and I've, I've been reading the Bible pretty consistently since high school. And I would say, I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface. It's a well, you know, because God <laughs> is unknowable. Yet he's made himself known. It's beautiful. And so I just want to say that because Psalms 1 shows a life that is faithful to this revelation. It describes and displays a life that is faithful to how God has revealed himself to man and what he's doing. It's also cool because Psalm 1 acts as a gateway to the psalm. You know, Psalm 1 shows okay, how to be faithful with God's word. And then there's all these other songs and psalms that, that then you can be faithful with and meditate on and dwell on. So, if you want to turn now to Psalm 1, we're going to read it together. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So I want to go ahead and start with the very first word, blessed. Blessed is the man. Biblical meditation leads to God's blessing. And the word blessing is a little vague, uh, maybe, um, but I think a helpful picture of it is what I've been reading in Genesis is the story of Joseph. I don't know if you know the story of Joseph. Um, he is one of 12 brothers uh, and not a good family dynamic. His brothers sell him into slavery. Um, if you're not familiar with the story, you should read it. Um, but, but terrible. He gets sold into slavery, and if there's uh, any situation in which um, you could be frustrated or angry, I imagine that's it. But yet you see the story of a man who flourishes. Even in suffering, you see the story of a man who God is with. And it seems like everything Joseph touches turns to gold. Like he just succeeds. God just blesses him. It's wild. And and when I start reading, I'm like, man, that would be nice. At my workplace, you know, the things go well. But I really think the story of Joseph is a picture of the blessing of God that is offered. If you read in verse 3, he shall be like a tree. So the Bible gives us, uh, he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. The Bible talks about living water and how God's spirit is living water and God's presence is a constant nourishment. So just like Joseph, how he didn't, when he was in prison or in slavery, how his, he did not I get, get crushed because God was with him, God promises and his blessing is to be with you. If you read the next thing, says, that brings forth its fruit in its season. The blessing of God is a fruitful life. Uh, You think Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. The blessing of God is a life lived that brings the blessing of God to others. It's a fruitful life. You see this in Joseph. Later on in his story, he went on to bless all the ancient world, saving it out of poverty and famine. You keep on reading. It says, the blessing of God is man whose leaf shall not wither. I read that and believe it's just you. The blessing of God is that you'll be able to flourish in times of suffering. That times of trial, that times of drought in your own life won't bring you down. Finally, everything he does shall prosper. So there's bad teaching out there called the prosperity gospel that says if you believe in God, you're going to get, you know, like a Mercedes, I don't know. You'll get all this physical and material wealth and nothing will ever go poorly for you. Uh, And thankfully, that's corrected by the words of Jesus. He says things like, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
He says, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus clearly shows that the blessing of God does not just mean a lot of money, but it is a promise of God's favor. I believe this is a promise of God's favor in what you put your hands to. Um, And that is very hopeful to me because I need help. (laughs) I... uh, um, I'm a young man, and there's a lot of things I don't know. I don't know how to do marriage perfectly well. We're expecting a little one. I sure don't know how to be a father. Um, I've started a new job recently, and that's taken a lot of blessing. And my hope is, and I've seen it been true, that God has blessed these things. He's blessed me in these things, and I think he offers this blessing to us. Not that everything will go well, or that you have a ton of money, or things like that. But I do believe he promises favor and mercy in what you put your hand to. This is the blessing of God. And I want this for you, and I want this for myself a lot. It's actually one of the main reasons I'm teaching this. is because as I was thinking about Psalm 1, I want this blessing for your lives. I want you to know God deeply and taste of his goodness and grace all the more. And because of this, I have to warn you that there is another path There's a path that does not lead to this blessing. Let's keep on reading in verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. This gives three commands there. The first one is walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. And I think you'll agree with me, um, there are so many voices in our world today. There are so many different pieces of counsel, from movies to media to news to entertainment. They all have a message to share about relationships, marriage, job, finances, what you live your life for. Like, we are inundated with voices, with messages, with counsel. And oftentimes, I would say that this this counsel is a mixed bag, which means that, that the things people are saying, there's often maybe hints of truth that make it believable. At the same time, there are lies and how they get to that end. And so what this is saying is that uh, don't walk in this council. Because it's true that you will be a student of something. Uh, What you decide to do and how you make your decisions is going to be based off something. You can't not be affected by the messages that you hear. It's a matter of which messages are going to affect you. And so, so what are you learning? And what Psalm says is do not walk in the counsel of those people who don't know God. Do not make your decisions based on ungodly counsel. The second command is stand not in the path of sinners. Um, So if you want to turn to Galatians Galatians 5.16 talks about this path that we take. I say then, oh, I'll wait. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not stand in the path of sinners. I believe the counsel, ungodly counsel, will lead to sinful ends. And what this verse is saying is there's something in us, the flesh, that actually wants that. (laughs) That it's warring against the Spirit of God to lead us down the path of wickedness, not down the path of righteousness. And so I want to ask you this morning, um, what path are you on? What counsel have you been listening to, and what is the outcome of your actions in your life? I think a lot of times life goes really fast, and it's it's hard for us to ask those questions. 
there's one uh, last command. It says, uh, who does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Um, and really, it seems like today this is like the water we swim in. It's seen as a virtue to be critical, to be cynical, um, to mock it. You can be seen as knowing um, if, you, if you mock and tear people down. Um, postmodern thought has really also saturated our culture, which um, scoffs at morality, objective morality, something that's actually true. Um, you can be seen as silly for believing in something to be absolutely true. And God says there's another way. Like with childlike faith, believe God's word is good. Believe what is good is good. And don't live a life of mockery. Don't live a life of scoffing. So, three commands. Walk not, stand not, sit not. And where is the end of this road? You can read in verses 4 to 6. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. In a word, the end of the road of wickedness is destruction. You'll be like chaff which the wind drives away. You won't stand in the final judgment of God. The message of Psalm 1 is that there is a day coming where we will stand before God and be judged based on our actions. So it goes on. You may be thinking a lot of questions at this point. I don't know. I, I, when I was preparing my message, I was thinking a lot of questions at this point. Uh, Media consumption, question mark. How much media is right to consume? Are you saying I shouldn't do anything at all? And that is a... uh, That's a different sermon for a different time. I'm sorry. Um, I would challenge you. I I will say this. I I can't tell you. I could tell you what I do and what our family does. But most likely what that will lead to you is comparison. Either you'll be bummed that you do a worse job than us, or you'll be pumped that you're doing a better job than us, and that won't be loving God, right? I think if you're asking your things, how much media should I consume? Uh, You know, what's, what's right, what's wrong? It's, it's a conversation you have to have with God and God's word. And I would I'd really challenge you to have that conversation. Um, it will be fruitful. But instead of answering the question of how much media to consume or what voices to listen to, I want to ask the question again. Do you honestly know what path you're on? The decisions that you're making today, the things that you believe about the world today, and what they're based on and what counsel on that they're based on. Do you know what direction your life is going. Because Jesus gives us a very sober warning. If you want to turn to Matthew 7, 13. I'm skipping ahead on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm sorry, John. Um, (laughs) Matthew 7, 13. And Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. I, this verse is hard for me. Like, it's just It's just hard but it's the words of God, and I have to heed his warning that broad is the path that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to life. And I think we can see that no Christian, no well-intending person out there decides to walk down this path. You know, just like you can see, no pastor starts off his work intending scandal, right? No marriage starts intending divorce. No boy starts out his life hoping to go to jail, you know. No girl starts off her life hoping to be a prostitute. No, it's a gradual road. Uh, C.T. Uh, C.S. Lewis has a quote in Screw Tape Letters. Um, let me see. I have it on my phone. You will say that these are very small sins. Uh, background: the uh, Screw Tape Letters is a book written by C.S. Lewis which is essentially a senior demon mentoring a younger demon in how to tempt a man, okay? 
Sounds crazy. It's a great book. You should read it. Anyway, um, you will say that these are very small sins. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. So remember, he's calling the enemy God, you know. Um, it does not matter how small the sins and provided that they uh, are, it does not matter how s- small the sins are, provided that their cum- cum- cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Our enemy is a liar, and he's good at it. And that's why this message is on my heart this morning. Do you know the path that you're on? Do you know the outcome of your actions? And have you considered them? What hope is there? Okay, this has been really heavy this morning. Um, What hope is there? And I want to say this morning, there is awesome hope. Read and uh, go back to Psalm 1. Should have just had you keep a finger in it. I should have kept a finger in it. Um, Psalm 1. Psalm 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The beautiful thing is that God has shown himself. God has revealed his will. He has shown the right way. Not only has he shown us the way to walk, he gives us the strength to be able to walk it. By meditating on truth, you are able to discern godly counsel from ungodly counsel. Psalm 119, 105 says that God's word is a light into our path and a lamp into our feet. That he shows you the way to walk. He actually gives you sight to see the things in the world around you. What voices are lies and what voices are truth. And to be able to walk the right road. God's word uh, helps us discern ungodly versus godly counsel. It also leads us to know what road you are on. John 1 talks about the coming of Jesus, and it says that he was a light come into the world. He's a light that poured out on the darkness of mankind and showed, showed us our hearts. It said a lot of people hated him because of that, because they saw that their works were evil, but some people turned and repented. And what grace is this that God wants us to know the road that we're on and the path that we're taking? Hebrews 4.12 says that God's word is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It can it can divide the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. Because we can lie to ourselves, right? I can. I'm really good at it. But God's word cuts through the veil, the shadow, and shows us the way that we're walking on. And I think most beautifully of all, the third point is that God's word leads us to delight in him. If you read near the end of John, John 20, 31, it says, so many things could be written about the life of Jesus. You could fill up tons and tons of books and what he did. But it says, the things in the book of John, that these things are written that you might believe, <laughs> believe in Jesus, that you might believe he is the Son of God. And when you go back and you read the book of John, you see beautiful stories of him bringing sight to the blind. People who had leprosy, which is a death sentence, he touches them and says, I'm willing, be cleansed. He brings uh, mothers, dead children back to life. And you can't help but love him. (laughs) When you read John, you can't help but love him. He's like, man, uh, Jesus is beautiful. He's awesome. And what the word of God does beautifully as we meditate on it is it leads you to love him. And it's a truth, and I don't want you to forget this truth, that what you do will flow out of what you love. What you do in your life will flow out of what you love. The Christian life is a battle for your affections first. You see how Psalms 1, it doesn't, it doesn't first say, blessed is the man who does the will of God, though that's important. That's so good, and it'll bring blessing to your life. But the first thing that Psalms 1 says is, blessed is the man who delights in the law of God. Because if you delight your action will flow out of that. And the gospel leads you to 
delight. Uh, John, John 10, 11. Um, if you want to turn there, it's, it's good. So, so Isaiah 53 lays out the state that we're all in. It says, We all like sheep have gone astray, each has gone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The beauty about God wanting your heart to delight in him is that every one of us has not taken the path to righteousness. Every one of us at some point has decided to go down the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. And the gospel and what makes Christianity different than every other religion is it says, yes, this is the case. But, but God sent his only son as a man who could walk the road. And because he walked the path of righteousness and rejected the path and the counsel of the sinners, he's one way to salvation. He's one way to life and life abundant for you. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. This is the, the words of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. If you turn to verse 25, he goes on. Actually, do verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. I and my Father are one. See, what hope is there? What hope is there is there is a God who has walked this path for you, and in believing him, you are saved, and you are also kept in the path. He will hold you fast. And this is a beautiful, beautiful reality. And so I want to uh, remind you of the words of, us, of the hymn, uh, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So, I, I believe the gospel is the core of this message. The core of biblical meditation is to delight in God, to worship God, and in delight you will follow the path of righteousness. And... There are practical things you can do that really help with this. So, some practicals for you. I want to remind you of Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8 and what it says. There has to be time where you are focusing on the Word of God. I would really encourage you, if you don't, have daily time in the Word. The world says a lot of messages that you're being inundated with, and you need to know God's Word to be able to discern, right? So I would say... I would really encourage you, daily time in the Word, build a habit. Life flows out of habits, too. Just build a habit of a consistent time where you can get in the Word and maybe find a friend to read it with, someone else who will keep you accountable. Um, focus on the Sunday messages. I don't know. John and Keenan do an awesome job. I'd say, just come. Come on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Hear God's Word. Um, the Old Testament class uh, explains God's Word. Uh, God... God has invented song as a way to remember his truth. There's a reason that you don't forget songs, because God made it that way. Um, so, n sing good songs. <laughs> sing songs that remember truth and what is good and what is lovely. Uh, also, memorizing scripture, having scripture on your mind, accessible, is really good. And so once you focus on all this scripture, I then encourage you, reflect on it. Reflect on the messages that you hear on Sunday morning. James, uh, I think, okay, I forget what chapter it is, but James talks about a picture of a man who looks at a mirror. Um, and he says, someone who sees the word of God and does not do it, is it like a man who looks at the mirror and instantly forgets what he looked like? I encourage you, take time, don't, don't forget. <laughs> take time to talk about the messages on Sunday morning. Take time to to dwell on the truths that you read in the Word in the morning. Take time to think about how does God's Word affect the decisions that you're making in your life right now. Take time to remember His goodness. <laughs> just, just the goodness of what Jesus has done and what He's done in your own life. Um, and if one, Take time to dwell on questions. 
I think if you're like me, uh, you grew up in the church and there's just some, for some reason, you feel like you have to know the Bible well. Um, and there's some questions that you can't ask. Ask those questions. If, you're, if you start the Bible this week, that would be awesome. And you're reading through Genesis. You'd be like, why is there a talking snake in the garden? Where did he come from? Um, you know, what is this guy who's going to crush the head of the snake? These are great questions. And the answer you're going to find in the rest of the Bible. <laughs> Take time to dwell on it. Take time to, to think about these things. With focusing on God's word and reflecting on it is the necessity of faith. Come expecting God to meet you. He wants you to know him. God delights in showing himself to you. And I think uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Come, come to his word, believing he wants to meet you, and he can. You'll be amazed. And the final note um, that I want to say before we do communion um, is time. Time is a necessary element in biblical meditation. And it's hard because, right, right now in our culture, busyness is seen as a virtue. Well, you ask a lot of people, how are you doing? You'll hear, busy. And strangely enough, we can admit inside ourselves we don't want to be seen as unbusy. But <laughs> there's this beautiful truth uh, that Jesus, Jesus accomplished all meaningful work on the cross. Your job now in life, your number one job, is to worship him. I would encourage you to think about that. You don't have to give into the crazy, frenetic pace of our world. The work is done. And now I know there are times of busyness. But I encourage you, remind yourself, Jesus died to free you from that pace of life. You're free to worship. And so, worship. So,